15 minutes after 7, it's time for us to get into the newsroom. And uh, joining me to have a conversation this morning, we have Eric Odor, who is the Secretary General for Kenya Union of Journalists. We also have Tom Osanjo, who's a veteran journalist. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us. And uh, before we get to our subject this morning, we'd like to look at the role of KUJ, MCK, and uh, the Editor's Guild. But before we do that, maybe just uh, to look at the story that we've just uh, seen there. And this is a story that has been going on maybe for the last few days, and this is to do with one a uh, Nairobi business uh, community uh, member who was harassed in broad daylight, uh, faces being seen. Uh, your thoughts, uh, let me start with you, Eric, on how we have covered this story and the fact that the police seem to be getting him now, uh, or yes. getting them now. Uh, thank you, Mike. You know, uh, looking at this story sometimes, it's just amazing that uh, some of these things can happen in this country and in a broad daylight. Uh, like Sophia Wanuna has asked uh, police uh, chief, uh, Owin, Mr. Owino, the media has done as much as, as, uh, it's, supposed, as it's supposed to do because um, we even have, have gone even ahead to publish the pictures of these people mm. and uh, with the headline, Untouchables. Yes, and I think all yeah, their pictures yeah, about there. two days ago, it, yeah, was, exactly. it was literally on the headline. Yeah, too, so the, the media has actually digged and uh, found the pictures of these people and their profiles, by the way, and information about these people and their whereabouts and where they hang out. So what we expect is that police will be now swinging into action and arrest these people and uh, charge them if there are charges uh, that can be preferred on them. So I think as media, as far as the media is concerned, we've done our work. We've uh, revealed the identities of these people. We've condemned it. So what actually remains is now the police to go and uh, arrest them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, uh, Tom, do you feel like we've done enough and not just the coverage, but when we talk about them being untouchable, have we gone into the details of who really are these men? Why are they untouchable? And who, what are their connections? Why, why would it take so long for the police to arrest them when this happened uh, uh, you know, on the 30th? You know, Mike, uh, I was actually <clears throat> astonished that such a crime can be committed in this time. In broad daylight. In broad daylight. And two, three days later, police have not arrested the suspect. And that they are known. So the media has done its part, which they have done a very good job of it. Don't you think then we should by now have uh, possibly uh, sh given more details of who these people are? Or why, think, why did it take long for them to be arrested? I think it's obvious these people are well connected. That's the reason. Because the media did its part. That one I can't blame the media. Actually, the, the, the honor lies on the police. Why didn't they take... If you go out here and assault Eric out here, I can assure you, Mike, by lunchtime, you'll be... In... If I'll not be arrested right there. <laughs> but but, but, even, but you see, even besides that, huh, we, wouldn't want, we would also want to see the hotel coming out very strongly in this matter because I don't think it's also appropriate for the hotel just to allow people to come there and start harassing and uh, slapping and kicking your guests and get away with it. So we we'll also want to see uh, the hotel also joining this debate very strongly just to ensure that these people are actually also arrested because that means uh, that even other guests in this hotel might not, not feel, feel safe. Mm -hmm. So hotel must also come out and demand that action is taken because this needs a lot of pressure to be put on police so that they can arrest these people because as it is being said, that these people are uh, known, <laughs> they operate in uh, City Hall, mm -hmm. and they are very powerful. <coughs> and I don't think if there is anybody who can be as powerful and uh, more than uh, that, police cannot arrest them, because mm -hmm. I think there's a responsibility of police to maintain a law and order. They have all the state machinery mm -hmm. that they can, at their disposal, that they can use to make sure that action is taken against this individual. So the police, are, they do not have any excuse or whatsoever not to arrest these individuals. Okay. I, I, think, I think Eric is right on that on this particular hotel, which we'll not mention. But uh, I do not feel safe going there to have lunch. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Although the hotel might argue it is not really in their jurisdiction to arrest or not arrest. I mean, it's the public no, no, domain no, what happened. No, the, Everybody knows what happens. Really, it li lies squarely on the police no, to the, do their the, work. Mike, the attack itself, it was the responsibility of the hotel to provide security for their guests. Mm -hmm. The attack should not have happened 
inside the hotel. One might argue that you may not have known that it's going no, to happen. It, it, I mean, it, they've had pre no, press it, conferences it, it, there it, before. It, you see, Mike, what we are talking about mm. here is that if you look at most hotels, um, they are supposed even to have uh, armed police officers mm -hmm. in this era of uh, terrorism. They are supposed to have armed police officers because police officers can always be seconded to hotels so long as hotels can pay. Mm. So at least you have one or two police officers there who are able to intervene in such cases. So I think hotels have got no excuse whatsoever. Mm. They must make sure that once you've entered a hotel, you are, you are guaranteed your security until you finish your business, whether you're going to have a press conference, you're going to have lunch, or, just go, or you're spending the night there. So the, the various stakeholders here who are supposed actually uh, to take part in this debate just to ensure that this uh, matter does not actually spill over to other hotels because mm -hmm. if action is not taken next will be another hotel it'll so be another I, hotel yes and and it's not an isolated incident because let me just bring to your memory we are accused as media of not following up uh, let me just remind you of uh, one tout who again was called untouchable uh, yes. uh, who literally kicked uh, a passenger and not just one i think he did it several times mm -hmm. the media brought it to the fore uh, but we still don't know what happened to uh, that gentleman is this another case that maybe it's likely to happen yes we are very quick to ensure that we keep the names going and once the police now have arrested do we follow up yeah, Talk, uh, yes, I, I think you're right there because like the story of that tout mm -hmm. it's like it just died like that we don't know if he was set free. We don't know if he was taken to God. I've not read anything about he it. He might still be scot free doing yeah, whatever yeah, he does. Maybe he's back mm -hmm. to beating up passengers. Mm -hmm. So, so, <laughs> so I, I think there should be a follow up. Like after this time, what happened to this guy? Mm -hmm. Where is he? Mm -hmm. uh, the, the other story I was interested in is this young man who was accused of conning female MPs. Some of the stories fizzled out. Mm. Don't know if he was ever <laughs> taken to court. <coughs> we know what happened? Yeah, it seems still... that once, once the authorities take over, we mm. don't really follow up to find out what happens. Uh, Eric, do you think maybe there's a lull there that we should take care yeah, of? Yeah, I think uh, that's true. Uh, I think those are some of the gaps that needs to be uh, addressed. Once these stories have been uh, published and they're out there, I think we also need once in a while just to go back, maybe probably weekly, just to find out. Like right now, what happened with these, uh, these individuals who attacked uh, Mr. Murioki? We need an even now to go back and find out other stories that have been done on untouchables and just try to find out where are they and if action was taken and um, what has already happened. Mm -hmm. So I agree with you that maybe these are some of the things that need to be picked up by the media so mm -hmm. that we are continuously making follow-ups and are just telling the public that these are the stories that uh, were done. We had similar cases where there this tout who has been harassing and uh, beating up passengers. We raise these issues. Maybe they are, they, this doubt has been arrested or he has not been arrested. So mm -hmm. I agree with you entirely that there needs need to, to be a follow up. Follow -ups, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And maybe this would probably fall also on the investigative desk. Tom, your thoughts on whether we need to possibly give more uh, time and more, uh, what would I call it, Va not value, but uh, add more resource to the investigative desk? Because that's an area that possibly would bring to the fore some of these things. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, investigative journalism is kind of dying in Kenya. I think maybe because of resources, or I don't know why, but I think media houses do not put much resources mm -hmm. into investigative journalism. And we, ne we need investigative journalism because this is where you unearth issues that are hidden. Mm -hmm. Like now, like the stories we're talking about, like this tout mm -hmm. or these untouchables. Investigative journalists will tell us who are they, where do they hang out. We are told they, they cannot be found. Yet on social media, we see them at a wedding. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I think the media just need to invest, <coughs> to invest more mm -hmm. in individuals. All right, uh, Eric. What do you think maybe uh, is the biggest challenge for us as media houses to have a very active <coughs> and robust? Uh, investigative desk because when you think of investigative journalism you actually think of individuals who yeah, literally yeah, put yeah, their yeah, lives true, on true, the line true, true. rather than thinking of uh, an institution that really takes care of investigative journalism uh, if I said investigative journalism to many you'd probably have a name like Dennis Okari you'll have Moha you have John Allen rather than having you know a, a media that is robust what do you think uh, we need to do to ensure that that desk is well Kitted. Yeah, I, I think that is a concern that uh, actually is, uh, runs uh, across uh, Africa. Uh, during uh, World Press Freedom Day, when we were having this conversation, because we had a session on investigative journalism, which I participated in, and what was coming out uh, across the continent is that uh, 
most media houses in Africa, we are not paying attention and uh, investing in uh, investigative journalism. Now the investigative journalism is just coming like this. It's a going concern to majority of um, newsrooms. So the arg argument was that we need to actually now take investigative journalism as at the center of uh, what we are doing in newsrooms by investing mm -hmm. uh, in investigative journalism. Because right now I think we are still in uh, the way of uh, trying and um, thing uh, what everybody's talking about now convergence uh, to the extent that uh, one journalist is supposed to do a story for radio tv online and all other platforms within that particular media house so you realize that journalists in that uh, media house they do not have enough time and even enough resources to sit down and uh, do an investigative piece because if you're talking about investigative piece or even uh, just an analysis you need time like uh, two or even a week just to sit down and uh, concentrate on that. But you realize that newsrooms right now, actually this issue of uh, cutting costs has actually affected the capacity of journalists to venture in investigative journalism. So the uh, uh, way forward is that we need to rethink on how we build the capacity of uh, various desks in, in, in newsrooms and one of them being investigative journalism because that is where, actually that is the apex of journalism. Uh, by giving them more resources and training even more mm -hmm. so that they can be able to, we can have as many investigative journalists as possible. Just like you indicated that if you're talking about it, you probably will be looking at about two or three names. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Tom? Mike, uh, and I think w one thing we must take cognizant the fact that uh, social media is becoming more and more popular with people. And this is why newsroom must invest in serious journalism. Mm -hmm. If you go on social media, if you go to, <coughs> for example, if you go on Facebook now, people have very low opinion of Kenyan journalists. You've heard the term Gideri media, mm. that maybe gutter press, something like those. So this one pushes the ball back right into the newsroom, that now you need to give people more content. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because now people rely more on social media. Mm -hmm. But, but what, what do you think is a challenge mainly, especially when it comes to investigative journalism? Is it because the training is not there? Is it, for instance, one of the things that we'll handle when we, uh, after the break is uh, the role for those institutions that are put there to protect the industry. For instance, Kenya Union of Journalists, we've got Media Council of Kenya, you've got Editors Guild. Uh, what, might, what resource is lacking? I believe th th there are enough trained journalists who can do it. It's only that I think the, the issue of cost cutting, so investigative journalists is not seen as something serious. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that's my view. Do you, do you think uh, that's the case? Uh, that, that, that is number one. Then there is also the issue of, you know, you talk about investigative journalists, there are also risks that are also involved. Mm. So you also need um, some very bold journalists who can go the, out there. And I also need also patience also. So, journalists who can go out there, take one or two, even two months just to investigate some of these issues. Because by the end of the day, like I've talked about the risks, by the end of the day, sometimes investigative journalism also end up interfering with your own lifestyle. Mm. Because one, you need to also hide in identity <coughs> because some of these stories are very sensitive. Mm. You can imagine if these guys can walk into a hotel and uh, flash out or, or, or get, get literally harassed harass these guys daylight, are in, in, in a front broad of daylight. cameras. Yeah, exactly. So it means that even you as a journalist who are going to cover and uh, unmask who these people are, you must also be very careful. So most okay. journalists also, maybe they're also afraid of venturing into investigative journalism because it means mm. it will interfere with your lifestyle. I know majority of uh, investigative journalists, some of them can't even work in, uh, during the day. Mm. They, even if they want to go to shopping, they shop at night mm. because it completely interferes with your uh, lifestyle. It is a security it, it risk. It is a, a security risk. If you, are, uh, if you are to drive, first of all, you need to find out how you need to be in a bulletproof. I know we are talking like there is a, a guy uh, in, uh, in Ghana who is known <laughs> a renowned <coughs> journalist, but this guy actually his lifestyle has completely been interfered with. So the guy is always working with security in bulletproof cars because some of the very stories are very sensitive. So it's also, it's a, it's a, it's, it is an expensive affair mm. that one, 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 uh, you want to venture in it, you must also look at the risks and how you are going to mitigate those risks. Those risks. All right. I wanted to take a break. When we come back, we want to look at uh, the bodies that have been put in place uh, that are there mainly to ensure that they protect the industry. That is the Media Council of Kenya. We've got the Editors Guild. And we also have the Kenya Union 
of journalists and find out what is their role, what are they there for. Uh, from Tom, of course, I'd want to know as a journalist who's been there for a long time, whether you have seen their um, role play out in your uh, uh, work and in your expertise. So we'll come back with that. But for now, we're going to take a short break. We'll be right back.